welcome everyone in the auditorium and good to see a good number online as well. So welcome to you as well. And uh, this is the director's seminar to mark the UN World Environment Day. And I'm Alan Kalman, deputy director here at WIHO. And thank you all for taking the time to attend this important seminar. Let me first acknowledge country and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land of Parkville, Kew and Bundura on which WIHI operates. We pay respects to their elders past and present and embrace their continued connection to the places where WIHI staff and students work. We recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first scientists on this continent and who asked questions and especially looked to the land, sky, animals and plants for answers. We acknowledge the ingenuity, resilience, design capability and collaborative and creative thinking of the First Nations people that enabled them to thrive and to ensure that the voices and designs of the first scientists were passed on from generation to generation. We respect that as the oldest living generations of teachers, artists, engineers and scientists, how they understood and continue to understand the world has benefited and will always benefit all of us. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders from other communities from where people are joining us virtually and all First Nations people who are here today. Today's seminar was organised by WEHI's Environmental Management and Sustainability Committee. This group has been championing improved environmental sustainability practices at WEHI since 2020 and is now involved in a sector-wide conversation and change on this topic. Just over 18 months ago, WEHI made a commitment to reduce operational greenhouse gas emissions and to transition to carbon neutrality for scope one and two emissions. This was accompanied by a pledge to resource and implement waste management strategies and to improve waste management. To deliver on these promises, quantitative and qualitative data has been critical to understand the key issues, stakeholders, the current state and the possible futures for the Institute. Data like this is vital for all organisations to chart their decarbonisation journey. It's easy to set targets, but hard, if not impossible, to achieve them without the evidence-based analysis to inform decision-making and to harness the power of collective action. This brings me to today, today's presentation on the findings of the Net Zero Australia study. Australia has now has a target to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. The Net Zero Australia study was designed to scrutinise the possible pathways to a net zero economy with the ultimate goal of supporting policy and business decision making. Importantly, the study aimed to be technology neutral, evidence driven and non-political. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Professor Robert, Robin Batterham, who will be sharing an overview of the findings of the Net Zero Australia study this afternoon. Professor Batterham is devoted to further, furthering energy research uh, at the University of Melbourne and is deeply involved with the Melbourne Energy Institute. After a period as an honorary staff member and a professorial fellow, Professor Batterham joined the Melbourne School of Engineering as Kurnow Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomedical Biomolecular Engineering in 2010. He brings considerable expertise and experience to the school and to his leadership role for Net Zero Australia, thanks to his long and very distinguished career in industry and government, including a stint as Chief Scientist of, of Australia. So Robin, welcome and thank you very much for agreeing to give a seminar, which we're looking forward to very much. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I too uh, acknowledge the Wurundjeri people. Uh, they've made a big difference to the University of Melbourne. You only have to look at all of the new buildings that have gone up to see that the design of them now embraces many concepts that have come from talking uh, with Wurundjeri elders. Uh, I won't rabbit off onto that topic, so relax, uh, but it really is quite something and happy to share that uh, with you uh, afterwards. Today, what we've got is a chance to talk a little bit about Net Zero Australia and a study that's almost complete. It's uh, almost there uh, and will be in about a month or so, but the uh, modelling results are now available. And let's 
run through, I'd suggest, um, three topics. Um, this is the classic, you're all highly intelligent people. And an awful lot of um, uh, social science uh, research has looked at the question of how do you get messages across? And the answer is you'd break it up into groups of three. And I don't know why, there's got to be some uh, evolutionary um, um, thing behind this, I don't know what it is, that, but testing shows that if you give people three messages, they'll remember them. Give them four or five, on average they won't. Uh, give them one or two and they think it's trivial, why are they there? So you're going to get three. Uh, what must we do? How do we do it? And what can I do? And I'll limit talking, I hope, to about half an hour or just uh, under. Uh, and then that way we can open up for uh, discussion and uh, questions. If something is just absurd or you really can't understand it, um, you know, shout out en route through and we can address it. So this is on the uh, first point. Uh, so this is talking a little bit about the study. You've already heard the key things. This is technology neutral. We have not assumed that it's all renewables or that nuclear is the answer to everything or anything else for that matter. We've just said, OK, we will take all technologies that are legally allowable in Australia and are already available or very close to it. So we're not going to wait for silver bullets, so-called silver bullets, or stuff which is emerging. We will put on all of these technologies, how they're going to get better and better through the years, um, and you'll see some data on that as we go through. Now, we're not trying to predict the future. Uh, if we were good at that, we wouldn't be here now. We'd be off um, helping other people, I might add. Uh, so what we've done is scenario-based, and I would call them bookends. We've picked scenarios that are the edges of debates. So we picked a scenario that says no fossil fuels whatsoever, unless you have offsets for them, and the offsets in this country are very limited, let me assure you, uh, it's got to be all renewables. That's one of our bookends, and there are several uh, others. You've already heard evidence-driven and rigorous and granular. We've done the modelling, as you'll see, almost in some areas down to postcode level, which is quite unique. So what's the task that we've got to do? This gives you something to feast your eyes on, and I'm not going to rehearse uh, everything written on slides. Australia is roughly 550 million tonnes a year of CO2 or CO2 equivalent per year. That's what we put up. Full stop, end of story. Um, you can see the breakdown of it on the left from 1990 through to about 2020. The stuff that we burn as energy or that we use as uh, energy, the resulting emissions, industrial processes, not much. Agriculture actually is uh, negative in those last uh, periods there. Waste, uh, sorry, agriculture is not. Uh, land use and land use change because we cut back on deforestation and actually planted a few trees. And though, so what we've said is um, from roughly 2020 to 2050, let's just impose an emissions constraint. Let's just go linear in reducing our emissions. Now you can argue we should go faster. So we've got a little bit of up our sleeve by 2050. You can argue we should go slower because a magic bullet is going to come along that just makes our life totally easy, whether it's blue this or green that or whatever. Um, or you can argue, actually, let's just run with that. You could argue that let's use the 1.5 global temperature rise scenario. What does that do to our carbon budget? Because we're about 2% of the world, roughly, et cetera. So you can come at it from all sorts of different angles. But what you'll see is that even if you just pick plain linear, you have to start running now. And this is going to be one of the main messages that comes out today. So um, to keep um, some people who think you can do it even faster happy, we've modelled 2040 for zero. And surprise, surprise, all it does is increase the rate of change. It doesn't say you fall off a cliff because you can't do it. You can still do it, but it's a much higher rate of change. So just remember the number, 550. 
Now look at our exports. We export 1250 that somebody else burns and emits CO2. Now, are those our emissions? No, they're somebody else's. But let's think global for a moment. It's our coal and our LNG that's being burnt. If the world heads towards 2050 net zero, the people who are currently doing that won't want those products because they're not going to be able to offset them. They're going to have to be importing hydrogen or a hydrogen carrier or an undersea cable to a country that's got plenty of sunlight and wind like Australia. So what we've looked at, and this is a pretty tough call, is to say, let's not just look at 550, let's look at 1250 as well and see what that does. Can we do it? And the answer is, yes, we can, if we decide we want to, if we make the choices to do that. Now, if that hasn't warmed you up for the numbers, cop this one. We export the odd bit of iron ore. Now, exporting iron ore is probably a long way from anyone in this room. Um, it's not a long way from me. I actually worked up in the Pilbara helping to export iron ore a long, long time ago. Australia exports 860 million tonne a year of iron ore, and it's not a bad business. Um, it sells for about $100 a tonne. Um, it's almost a better business to be in um, uh, than coming up with a new vaccine, by the way. Uh, and you can make your own guess as to what it costs to dig it up and treat it just a little bit and put it on a ship. But let's say for argument's sake, you guessed that it was somewhere between 10 and $20 a tonne. So you've got 860 million tonne at, let's say roughly, because sometimes it's as high as $160 a tonne, let's say $100 a tonne. That's Australia's prime export. Jolly good. What happens when it goes overseas and is turned into steel? in Japan, in China, in Korea, uh, in Europe uh, as well, by the way. Oh, well, it's just a cool 800 to 1,000 million tonne a year of CO2. So is that Australia's? And again, the answer is no. It's China, Japan, Korea, uh, etc. But what if we were to use our sunlight to make hydrogen, to convert the iron ore into iron here in this country? So instead of exporting something at say $100 a tonne, you're exporting it at four to $600 a tonne, just to the arithmetic. Do we have the capacity to do that? And the answer is yes. Alumina is there, it's just a cool 300 million tonne a year. That's about six, um, remember Australia is 550. So these are very big numbers that potentially Australia could be involved in. So let's move on. So there's your first point. If I summarize it in one line, we're dealing in some very big numbers. So what must we do? We've got to decarbonize 550. We could decarbonize exports and we could be an energy superpower and say no tier three exports. By the way, just to put us in perspective, the USA is currently tier one and two over three times uh, Australia. So they've got a much bigger uh, challenge than we have. So how do we do this? We ran scenarios. Let me talk about E plus and E minus just a little bit. E plus is what we've called rapid electrification. The whole key to getting to net zero is primarily electrify. Uh, and I won't rub it in by saying like the old, uh, you know, um, what sells the best properties on the property market and it's position, 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 we all know that. Um, what gets you to net zero effectively and quickly? Electrify, electrify, electrify. Just electrify everything that you can think of as fast as you can. So we ran a scenario where we electrified everything, 
within reason as fast as you can. I mean, you have to say that just because you decide to do it, all households aren't going to turn over to electric cooking just like that, bang. It won't happen like that. There's time to change things out, even with the best uh, incentives uh, in the world. Likewise, electric cars. You can't have everyone changing to electric cars. It's got to be on timescales compatible with getting rid of your existing cars, plus putting in infrastructure for charging and not having to string up wires through the local tree or note to get over to your house so you haven't got a, an extension cable across your uh, footpath to your car parked outside. So. Even rapid electrification does have some limits to it. And then, especially for Victorians, and we're here today amongst obviously quite a few Victorians, um, what do you do with all your gas? You can't just instantly say, make every household that heats with gas or cooks with gas or has their hot water from gas, bingo, you're gonna be electric uh, tomorrow, doesn't work. So we've done a scenario where on the supply side, we've left gas in for quite a while. So here's our three, that was the demand side. I think I said supply, I meant demand. Here's our three supply scenarios. One is to say, the one I've already mentioned, full renewables, no excuses, everything has got to be renewable. And we'll look at what it is. It's going to be more than three times the current a whole electricity grid by 2030. Just think of that, let those sort of figures uh, sink in. We did one that said, look, Australia has the world record for solar installation, uh, both on rooftop and also on the ground, apparently. I didn't realise the latter until Alan Finkel corrected me uh, this morning. Um, Let's say that you can do eight to 10 times that rate. That's for solar, eight to 10 times the world record for the rate of installation per head of population. And that's our constraint. Now you might say that's heroically large. And I would say that's what we've taken as the lower limit for having to put renewables in. And you'll be starting to get a feel now for the numbers that I'll be sharing with you. Onshoring. Onshoring is when we say, take hydrogen that you might be exporting as a replacement for LNG and gas and use it to convert iron ore to iron and alumina to aluminium or bauxite to alumina to aluminium and other things if you can. Okay, let's move on. Let's get something about technology. Here is a beautiful graph which the National Renewable Energy Lab in the United States puts out every year. And for those of you with incredible eyesight, you're gonna be able to read it, but that doesn't matter. The point is this, here's the, do I have a pointer? I'm not sure that I do. Um, no, there's not a cursor on it. Okay. You go out and buy, you go out and buy a solar cell to put on your roof, that's the sort of efficiency you're likely to get. Now what this, it's not spaghetti and meatballs because they're all heading in one direction. What this diagram tells you is really quite exciting. It's the development rates for the efficiency of various types of solar cells. And what you can see is that people in the laboratory were at 23% back in 1995. Now this tells you something about the learning rate in going from something at laboratory level out into a commercial product. Now what it also tells you when you look at it is that the slope is always upwards. By the way, if it's not, they take them off the graph, um, they're failures. And we get plenty of those in the lab, we all know about that. Um, the slope is generally upwards, so we might expect that the efficiency will come up to 40% or so. But my contention would be, don't expect that to be something that you can buy and put on your roof in under 20 or 30 years. So we've put learning rates, I'm not sure if I have it here, yes I have. We've put learning rates on solar 
no different to what it's been for the last 30 years. And the evidence is this sort of thing. So we're not into the, what I'd call the silver bullet technology bit. We're into the very pragmatic, how have they gone for the last 30 years or so in this area as a predictor forward? You can argue dangerous ground, but that's how we've forward predicted prices. And solar will come down so cheap that existing wind farms will get turned off because they're nowhere near economic against solar, depending, by the way, on the cost of batteries and how much interconnection you've got and a few other things like that. So this is how we've done the calculations. Now let's look at the results. Here is Australia now, and the lines on it are either the state divisions or our um, arbitrary divisions. We chunk areas up when we're looking at transmission lines. There's a wonderful question with transmission lines that says, OK, Wehi wants to go zero emission. There's a solar farm up in the Northern Territory. What are the economics of connecting Wehi, just Wehi, to a solar farm in Northern Territory? Utterly ridiculous, of course. But if you want to go zero emission and you want to buy zero emission power, you've also got transmission to think of. So there's always a question of when you place solar resources or wind, are you better off to place them near where the usage is and just have a short transmission or place them where the sun shines best, and it's not Melbourne, I can assure you, and have a longer transmission line. Now that is actually a very complex problem because there's timing in it. Once you put in a transmission line, you of course put it in for a little bit more capacity than you actually designed it for in the first place, or such that it's upgradable. There's all sorts of stuff that sits behind that. So we started with what we've got and we said, OK, in terms of transmission, we're not going to allow much more than one region to another because you just won't get people to put the money up for projects when you haven't established the market, you know, blah, 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 a whole load of reasons like that. So the first thing our economic optimizer did, by the way, was whack in a transmission line from Western Australia to the east because it's cheaper to follow the sun than it is to put in batteries. Simple as that. Um, so we then adjusted our uh, restraints on um, uh, building uh, interconnect. So there's 2030. Now what you see here is some pretty big interconnect. So the projects that are going on in Queensland at the moment that are talked about between South Australia and New South Wales, we didn't find economic by the way, but South Australia and Victoria is, doubling of the link to Tasmania, blah, 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 whole host of things are there and have to be done. What you're looking at there is three times the grid that we currently have, three times. And you're seeing the first of an export hydrogen export uh, heading up in the Northern Territory there to one of the permissible ports. 2040, look at the export solar hubs developing and note that there's no economic reason why you would connect them down south. This is all to do with exports, but you will see that the down south is thickening up no end. Look at all the wind farms going in you'll start to need special tracks through if you want to take the ferry to go to Tasmania. If you fly, you go over the top of them, of course, or you hope you do. 2050, you've now got five, six or so solar Tasmanias. 2060, there you go. Over 40% of all projects <clears throat> are on lands associated with indigenous people, one way or another. So they better be involved in deciding they want to have it. And we did have uh, the um, uh, Native Land Titles, the president of the uh, National Native Land Titles Councils as part of our advisory group and did an awful lot of work with them as to what 
might be acceptable uh, in the thinking. So they've been heavily involved, as has the Australian Conservation Foundation, as has the ACTU, at least up until the public launch, uh, and many, many others. So this has been a real inside the tent rather than just a bunch of engineers off on their academic ivory towers having a think about it. So there's Australia 2060 net zero, including exports and including treating, I can't remember whether this, what I'm showing you there is onshoring or not. Actually, no, it's not. Onshoring looks even better. Southeast Australia, just to show you the extent of it, those areas are not artistic license. Um, that's plotting areas down to, as I've already said, postcode level. The, to do these sums, we had many, many limitations on where you could place stuff, particularly the National Farmers Federation and many on the farming side did not want to see Australia's farming jeopardised for zero emissions. The farmers still want to produce farm products and to do so with zero net zero emissions themselves. Equally, there are a lot of lands where you can't put wind and where you can't put solar for a whole string of reasons, and some of them are listed there. The one of the biggest, this is the indigenous estate category, and I think it's yeah, 43% of projects are cited on indigenous estate of one sort or another. By the way, the approval time currently in the Pilbara to get heritage clearance is eight years. That's for when you have got agreement for a project to proceed. You then have an eight year clearance for heritage clearance. So just think of how you might get your 2030 year target, let alone 2050. We're going to have to learn to do things differently. So here's the summary. Three broad categories. I've already said just electrify and grow renewables. That really stands out. You need a large fleet of batteries, pumped hydro. And here's a message that an awful lot of people don't want to hear gas-fired firming. Our projections for the cost of batteries and our calculations for the amount of pumped hydro that's available in Australia that says you cannot have a reliable electricity supply with just relying on batteries and pumped hydro. Full stop. It's a numbers game and an economics game. So what you do is you have gas-fired turbines, and you can actually run them um, uh, with uh, natural gas, uh, but then you've got to offset it through direct air capture. Um, but here's the thing. These gas-fired turbines are roughly twice the capacity that we currently have of all gas-fired turbines in this country, but they're used for about 2 to 5% maximum of the time. And at the moment, we just don't have economic structures that would allow people to make an honest living having a turbine that sits there 95% of the time unoccupied. But when you have a blocking high and a whole pile and or a whole pile of overcast skies and your batteries aren't enough and your pumped hydro isn't enough, what do you do? Brownouts for all? So these are, whoops, these are choices that you've got to make. One, don't destroy wee high equipment. Um, <laughs> do you want to have a brownout life, as a lot of people in some countries already have, or do you want to have the reliability? So do you want to have all research institutions, institutions and universities and hospitals, for that matter, having their own standby generation that can cope with almost up to full capacity? They're the choices. So greatly increase electrification. We've already talked about that. You do have to use carbon capture, utilisation and storage, whether people like it or not. We can talk about CCS if you want to. The numbers don't add up unless you do that. 
And you just need a cool seven to nine trillion of capital. Uh, and I'm not sure whether I have it in the slides. If you can bear with me, I'll just duck ahead and see uh, if I've got, yes, I've got the economics, so I won't talk on that for the moment. Um, here's one that some people like, some people don't. We did run nuclear as a sensitivity. And unless it comes down to costs that are way below our estimates anyway, you just don't use it. There's a very small role for it if you can reduce the costs way below what they currently are. So that's interesting because a lot of people think nuclear is the answer for Australia. The economics just don't add up. We can transition our exports. We've got to locate these export industries probably in the north. You can get away with some in the south. Now, the fact that you need seven to 800,000 more people working in the area, I don't think it's off-putting. That's a small number compared with the number that work in health services now. There's 100,000 people working in the area of electricity, energy, uh, and so forth now. Um, and I don't think growing to seven or 800,000 by 2060 is too much of a problem. Moving the land sector, we've already mentioned uh, they want to get to net zero uh, anyway. And my goodness, you've got to manage the land use changes carefully. We don't even know when you put in a Tasmania size solar farm, what does it do to the wildlife? What does it do to the biodiversity? If you only cover 20% of the area and you have plenty of corridors, does that affect the biodiversity? We can't actually answer that question. We've assumed the answer is yes and said the limit is 20%. Um, endangered species is somewhat easier, uh, except that the, if you like, the atlas of endangered species is, is nowhere near adequate for going through to 2050, because that tends to be size of habitat. Um, and you can look after that. So we've done what we can with endangered species with biodiversity, but I would point to it as a national weakness in our understanding of what we have and how we preserve it, because preserve it we must, that's clear. Let me run through some figures and then get on to what we can do and then we can open up for discussions. So here's primary energy. The reference case, by the way, is sort of a business as usual. If you don't put in policies that are going to change things, stuff does get cheaper. People do turn to solar and put more in and wind and so forth just because it's cheaper. So things do change. But overall, you can still see an awful lot of coal there and an awful lot of gas. And of course, refined oil products because you don't change out your cars. Um, I'm not going to rehearse all the scenarios. The E plus um, is by far the most attractive. If you just do renewables and you don't allow some use of refined fossil liquids, for which you've got to have the offset, um, by the way, um, then you'll find, as you can see, the um, RE plus, that's the go gangbusters on renewables, just massive solar uh, in the country. Um, if, it's, if you restrict the renewables on land, you'll find the offshore grows like crazy, costs you a bit more, but it uh, can still get there. And the interesting one is we can do all the onshoring. You actually do better than just tackling the exports and selling hydrogen. So using hydrogen in Australia ends up making much more economic sense than exporting it. But that's the deal you're going to have to do with the Japans, the Koreas and so forth, who currently take our iron ore and convert it to iron and steel. Now, these numbers should be, um, if you uh, let me not exaggerate, uh, should be um, a bit of an eye opener, if not terrifying, uh, when you look at the just for the domestic, so this is not counting the exports or the onshoring, just for the domestic, look how storage grows. This is an incredible amount of batteries and you would have to put in four or five times that if you weren't going to allow gas to do firming on the two to five percent of the time. 
That's what the numbers come to. It's all about weather prediction, by the way. Uh, we've gone down to hour by hour over six years and then used six, um, come up with uh, through the day numbers for about eight typical days. I think it is something like that in our modeling. So this is down to hour by hour for the whole of Australia over each area counted individually. And here's the six or well, seven to nine in that diagram, but I would say about six uh, plus a trillion. Now, here's the interesting thing with a number like that. Remember, Australia is about a two trillion economy. The interesting thing is look over at the reference scenario. We will have spent by 2060, one and a half billion on trillion, sorry, on energy anyway. I mean, this covers the cost of appliances, the cost of cars, not just the cost of the energy itself. It's everything on the energy side. So we're going to spend that anyway. Now, I would suggest that if we're going to do the convert the exports, that will be financed by the people who want them. Exactly as happened with iron ore and exactly as happened with LNG. And we built up two, we're the largest LNG exporter in the world currently, and we're certainly the largest iron ore exporter. And they didn't come out of your pockets. They came out of the people that wanted the product. So when I back those off, the amount that we're looking at to get to net zero starts to become a reasonable sum. So emissions are one thing, the green economy is a frame of mind. This gets into what should we all do? You've just seen what the country has to do. Um, I'll leave you to read it. You don't need to get into the fine uh, print there. But emission, reducing emissions is just one part of heading to a green economy. And you've got to think about the environmental uh, objectives. You've got to think about eventually getting to a circular uh, economy. And you've certainly got to think about the social outcomes. There are winners and losers in this. And you've got to be pretty careful to make sure that those that can't afford to buy an electric car aren't penalised by much higher transport costs. For example, penalties on the use of fossil fuels, such as a carbon tax. So it's actually a very complex thing to make sure you're going to get social justice in it. So last slide and then open for uh, questions. What can I do? Let's pull it down to that level. So I would say, firstly, be conscious of your own uh, consumption. Next, think long life articles. Don't buy things with a short life because embedded in everything, including this cup of water from which I'll take a sip, are emissions. Eventually, we're going to get to a circular economy, but we can each do our bit by buying stuff which is inherently long life and or recyclable. That's a choice. We don't have to have fashion items. Um, at the breakfast table this morning, we were looking at an article that described a birdhouse that cost a couple of thousand bucks. And you've got to say, and that was because of the materials it was made of and paying for the design and so on. You've got to say, no, no, that's not a zero emission path. Electrify at every opportunity. So when you get the chance to upgrade your cooktop because it really doesn't work anymore or the oven doesn't work uh, anymore or what have you, if it's gas, think about going to electricity. Uh, Betterham has no connection with appliance sales or electricity companies or anything uh, like that. Um, I'm just saying as a principle, think at each chance that you have for major upgrades, can you electrify? Um, are the windows across the back of your house uh, that leak and uh, et cetera, et cetera, suitable for just getting them fitted out with decent windows and double glazing, et cetera? 
and so on. These are the personal things you can do. Communities, we really haven't started thinking. You're in a community here, the Weehai community, but that's actually a bigger community. It's Weehai, the hospitals, some of the university uh, and so forth. What can we do as that sort of community? Equally, wherever you live, is the local car park at the football field um, covered in solar panels two metres high? So you can still get the cars in and out. Um, the mind boggles at how many of the poles that support them would get wiped out by um, people who are careless driving, but uh, you get in the drift. Um, what can you do at community level? There's all sorts of things. We should be, but we're not yet there, that say if we've got smart appliances behind our smart meters, then at a community level, you can start doing your own power deals. This is technically possible now, why aren't we doing it? And the answer is because everyone in this room probably doesn't have the buttons to press to make it happen, but it's the sort of things we should be discussing and then they will uh, happen. So the notion of local grid management and generation just hasn't taken off yet in Australia and it should. That's something we can all push for apart from the personal stuff. And I've already mentioned geothermal. Um, I'm having a serious think about whether the university can stand the cost, that's probably about 30 mil, uh, of drilling down under Port Phillip Bay, because would you believe Port Phillip Bay has a wonderful blanket. There's the basalt that flowed out, there's lava flows there, and underneath it is brown coal. The first mine in Victoria wasn't gold, it was brown coal. And it was down at Point Ormond at the end of Glen Huntley Road, where they found an outcrop of brown coal. And they dug it up, it was pretty good stuff, blah, blah, blah. Then they followed it down under the sea. And unfortunately, eventually the pumping costs got them. So the economics uh, said stop. The mullock heap from what they dug out that wasn't coal, and the difference between brown coal and dirt, it's not very great, but that's another story. That's the little hill down at the end of Glen Huntley Road. It's actually a mullock heap from the first mine in Victoria. Now, let me get to the point. Brown coal is a wonderful blanket, a thermal blanket. So that means that the normal geothermal heat, which just comes up to the surface and is lost, is trapped. So you only have to go down a kilometre to find temperatures that are instead of four kilometres normally, to find temperatures that are totally usable for heat for buildings. And I might add, uh, you can also reverse it and do cooling uh, in summer. So I look at that lot and say, yeah, well, you know, it costs about 10 million to build a drill a decent sized hole. Uh, this is perhaps three or four holes, uh, you know, perhaps three. Um, and you'd want something, oh, he's done it again. You'd want something about the size of we high the institutes across the road and the hospitals, and then they would have zero emission heating and cooling. Why not? Okay, so anyone with a spare 30 mil or so, come and see us afterwards and um, we'll do a deal. Um, and the uh, I'll finish with an aside. The guy that invented this drilling technique, which is about quarter of the cost normally of drilling holes, is now implementing it in the USA, courtesy of uh, Biden's <coughs> Inflation Reduction Act. That IRA is going to do wonderful things for bringing on new technologies. So let me finish at that. I've covered the ground, I hope, of what can Australia do, how are we going to do it, and what can we all do individually, and open for questions. Or shooting it all down, be my guest. <laughs> Thanks very much, Robin. That's uh, fantastic uh, to see how uh, complicated and difficult it's going to be for us to get to net zero. Perhaps I can start and have the, the first question. Um, we've just gone through a period, uh, a global crisis, uh, where uh, the solution has been to develop uh, new vaccines that uh, help solve, mm. don't solve it totally. And that was done in one year compared to the normal time it takes to develop a vaccine, which is about 10 years. 
And the, the way that was done was essentially to throw money at it through the uh, warp speed, perhaps the only good thing to come out of the Trump presidency. But um, have you factored into this that there's likely to be increasing amounts of money uh, being uh, basically pumped into uh, the achievement of net zero as we yeah. get closer to 2050, when people start to realise the importance of speed and actually doing it? Yep. Yeah, um, terrific question, because the example has now been set uh, through COVID, which is uh, your point. What we've done here um, is what I'd call chapter one. What we've said is, if you want to get to net zero, what have you got to do? And we've said it with this uh, very practical bent of using what we've got and how it will improve in time. So we've deliberately avoided answering that question in this study. Um, that's put us in the position where pretty obviously uh, that's the main question. And the way that we're going to answer it is we are going to do a chapter two, even though chapter one is not quite finished yet. Uh, and it will concentrate on what can you do in the next 10 years that then cements a path in so it's the sort of things that say, what would you focus on if you had your druthers that's going to minimise the impact on people, higher energy bills, uh, et cetera, plus biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. And there's some things that actually leap out uh, as being uh, pretty obvious ways to go. And if we could figure out, well, how could you invest in those to speed them up? It perhaps won't be as spectacularly uh, successful as what happened uh, during uh, COVID, um, but it, it could be that, uh, I don't want to sound like um, I can only think of geothermal, I can think of many things, but I could use a geothermal example and say what we just talked about for the university, you could do that in local communities. Um, in the UK, they've figured out that they can't possibly have enough renewable energy to heat houses. People will die because houses can't be heated the way they're heading if they want to get through to uh, net zero. So they've, what they've said is, uh, and Germany is also thinking along these sort of lines, you've got to have ground heat pumps. Well, the smartest way of doing that when you've got existing buildings is not to find a place on everybody's land. If you live in a terrace house, that's pretty hard, or a block of flats, uh, is to do it out in the street where you've got unrestricted access to going down and then pipe heat and cool in and out. And if it has to be through pipes that run up the outside of the building and are as ugly as you know what, so be it. So there are things that can be done. At the moment, we've got a shopping list and we don't have, haven't done the work just as we've done here, to go through the economics in a lot of detail to say what makes most sense. By the way, it wouldn't surprise you that governments in particular, plus banks, uh, the next big ones, are asking us the answer to that. Um, yeah, hello. Um, so, so we are biologists here. So I'm going to ask you a biology question, and I realize that that's not your area. Correct. But I was interested in the negative growth in the land use group that you showed. So the negative growth in the land use. Oh, yeah. Yeah, category. Yeah. And you also talked at various uh, places offsetting, and some one way of offsetting at the moment is to plant trees. Yeah. But trees, uh, that's sort of, in my mind, a, a temporary CO2 storage. So they, they of course, um, store CO2 while they grow, but eventually everything that grows in biology rots again. Exactly. And then the CO2 is released into the exactly. atmosphere again. So how did you take that into account in your models? Yeah, thank, thank you for that. There's a lot of people, um, 
I'm of course not a biologist, but I actually understand that particular problem enough to give you an answer. There's a lot of people in this country and many others who say it's offsets. I'm actually very cross with the University of Melbourne at the moment, uh, but you're not allowed to hear these things in public, so I'm not. Um, they're sort of um, using for their get to zero, their got an element of it, so I've got to be fair to them, that is about offsets. And I look at this and say, no, the whole world can't go chasing offsets because there aren't enough offsets, blah, blah, blah. Do the arithmetic, just don't do it. As a, a leading institution, don't buy one offset. That's pretty cruel, uh, but nevertheless, that's uh, I've got strong, re you can see my reasons for that. And sector. Um, that's very interesting. We talked to the farmers and there are farmers in Australia who have sold offsets. For example, Microsoft has offset uh, its emissions by a deal with a very large landholder in New South Wales who's changed their farming practice, et cetera, to generate the offsets. And I look at this and say, no, 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 Microsoft, um, the whole world can't do that, number one. And that farmer has given away Australian assets, which we Australians can no longer count excuse me, I don't find this a very good position. So we talked to the farmers and it's interesting, you can plant trees on about, um, I think we ended up with 50 million hectares uh, being planted out and that does have a temporary uh, effect. And as you point out, it is temporary because eventually it rots. But here's the more interesting thing, the soil carbon is what you go for. Now, if you do an analysis of, uh, and we all know the sort of structure, anything that grows above has got something uh, down below. Now you start to look at what's down below and you see, this is not just about the structure of the tree, the roots. Um, you look at the uh, mycorrhizal fungi that attach themselves to it um, and mineralize and solubilize some of the minerals that the tree needs, etc. And by the way, for something like 70% of all species are the main water gatherer. It's it's not the roots direct, it's the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, some of them don't do it that way. Uh, and then you look at the bacteria that are there and, and so it goes on. And then you look at the products of the fungi and the bacteria and they include long chain carbon molecules. Surprise, surprise um, to anyone that understands the biology of it. If you've got a healthy soil biome, you are accumulating carbon in the soil. You are also generating soil, by the way, because the minerals that they attach to, you break them down and they end up as a, you know, part of a living uh, soil. The average age globally, if you go one metre down, the average age of the carbon products in soil one metre down, assuming you've got a metre of soil, uh, is 7,000 years. Now, I would argue if you are increasing the soil carbon at depth through the use of deep-rooted species, change our rangeland practices, uh, don't start me on this, um, but you can see where I'm heading, such that you're accumulating carbon at depth that you can count. Because if we haven't sorted this lot out in 7,000 years, we don't deserve to be on the planet. Um, <clears throat> so what you haven't mentioned is the actual embedded carbon in this entire renewable network. So the other day I was looking at a paper from um, a, looking at the life cycle of a Gamesa something light wind turbine in Texas and they had rather shocking su tables suggesting that at the end of all their analysis it only produced 3.4 times the amount of energy that it took to build it. So around, so you're starting out about 30% underwater. Then you've got about 10% losses in transmission. So at 40%, if you want to use this to power a battery, which you probably have to do for frequency control, um, the efficiency is about 20%. So you're already at 60%. You then pump water uphill to store energy in some form, you're at 25%. And then by the time you've uh, powered your electric car, you're at about 105% and you haven't built a single battery yet. So I would like to see in this sort of analysis um, exactly 
how much, what is the carbon cost? Because I mean, that's just talking about the energy, right? Yep. To build this thing out. And that doesn't include all these new transition networks and all the rest of it. So what is the carbon, embedded carbon in an entire hmm. um, renewable network? Yeah, um, good question. We've considered some of that, but uh, you're spot on, absolutely uh, nowhere near uh, uh, all of it. Um, the embedded carbon is one, it, it comes down to life cycle analysis um, for everything that you've got there and doing your alternatives based on life cycle analysis. We haven't done that in this study uh, and it's absolutely a worthy topic, uh, I might add, so I'm not, not avoiding it. Um, it's not at all obvious in some areas that we have the supply chains to supply some of the materials, just to even add uh, further to that. Um, copper is the one where one is uh, reasonably confident. Some of the others are rare earths and the like. But I think what has to happen here is that because when people start doing a lot more of these sort of sums and taking the full carbon accounting, that's going to change design quite markedly. So at the moment, these massive uh, wind turbines that you're referring to, and they get up to the stage of you know, having rotors, that, uh, having blades that are 100 metres long. Just think of transporting uh, you know, 20,000 of these things through the countryside um, and how you do that, uh, let alone the carbon cost of uh, transporting them, let alone the concrete uh, basis that they sit on. We're going to have to start thinking about how can they be made uh, themselves with a much lower carbon footprint. Well, that's happening with the turbine blades, by the way. They're ending up being very complex, um, uh, you know, very smart materials, very thin and so on. But equally, how do you recycle them? Already in Australia, landfill no longer takes used solar panels. So, and who are you going to export them to, by the way? This is a global problem. So you're going to have to design solar panels so that you can recover the materials that are in them and that whole lot with reasonable energy efficiency. So a one-line answer to your question is we are nowhere near yet answering the full set of questions, nowhere near. Okay, we're at the end of our time uh, and apologies to those online who have questions. Uh, we uh, uh, just don't have time to answer them. And uh, for those interested in WeHi's journey towards a more carbon, towards carbon free footprint, um, you can find it online on Catalyst or on the WeHi website. And thank you very much, Robin. It's really been a fantastic uh, seminar. It's really opened our eyes to how difficult it's going to be to get to net zero, but also uh, given us food for thought in WeHi's journey towards reducing its carbon footprint and at some stage getting to net zero uh, as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.